this month on 219 West, Making It in New York. You know you've arrived when you make it on Broadway, but what does it take? You've got to have the tenacity of a pit bull, okay? Also, Making It in a Man's World, a new program to get more women working behind the scenes of New York's TV and film industry. And just how does a small business get a slice of the pie? The best of the best come to New York City for a reason. And, um, to and make I, it. To make it and to, you know, to be around motivating people. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by students at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm Mary Grace Murphy. And I'm Margaret Teich. Also in this edition of 219 West, an artist who's gaining respect thanks to an unexpected muse. But first, the environment. April 22nd is Earth Day, and this year there are fresh efforts to clean up some of New York's dirtiest waterways. After more than a century of pollution, Brooklyn's Gowanus Canal has become one of the nation's most contaminated bodies of water. But the federal government wants to change that. A few weeks ago, the Environmental Protection Agency designated the canal a Superfund site. That means that the companies that polluted the canal will now be required to pay for its cleanup. Just a few miles from the Gowanus, another dirty waterway is getting cleaned up. Emily Johnson has the story. For decades, the people who live near Paradigate Basin in Brooklyn dreaded the rain. Getting wet wasn't the problem. It was the smell. Uh, let's say uh, rotten eggs or potatoes are good compared to that smell. When there was a heavy rainfall, the sewage treatment plant in nearby Sheepshead Bay could only handle a fraction of the sewage. The rest, sometimes millions of gallons of untreated water, came out at the designated overflow location, right at the north end of Paradigate Basin. But recently, ongoing construction of sewage overflow tanks on the basin's northern shore has cut down on residents' complaints. So there's holding tanks can hold some of that excess rainwater, capture most of it until dry weather periods, and then pump it uh, to the treatment plants. But worse even than the smell is the effect the dumping of sewage has had on this small waterway for more than a century. The overflow tanks are part of a $14 million stimulus initiative that will create an ecological park and restore 38 acres of wetlands to the basin. But the health of Paradigate Basin is directly affected by the health of Jamaica Bay as a whole. Just how much can this local project accomplish when the water that comes in from the adjoining bay is so polluted? And a lot of it, it's good for, you know, public, for public use, for public education. And it'll, as I said, it'll be somewhat of a buffer, but it's not going to uh, really solve the problem, you know, very much. Nitrogen levels in Jamaica Bay are sky high due to three other wastewater treatment plants and years of urban runoff. But experts believe it will be the combined effect of local projects like the one at Paradigate Basin that will be the key to cleaning up the larger ecosystem. And the only way to do that is by having, um, on a large scale, uh, but uh, small individual projects that are replicated on a large scale throughout the city. History shows that when Jamaica Bay thrived, so did the communities along its shores. But contamination wiped out a thriving oyster industry in the early 1900s, and the area has struggled ever since. Well, the, the communities living around the bay and along the bay, we, you know, rely on the bay to some degree. You know, their property values for recreation, the, the fishery in the bay. A lot of people come to the bay to go birding. It's one of the major birding spots in, in the tri-state area. Local officials are optimistic that restored wetlands and a cleaner Paradigate Basin will help revitalize the area. The new ecology park will include viewing platforms and an educational center for students and tourists. Emily is here with us now, and I understand there have been some late developments in the story. Yes, in February, the city and state came to an agreement which will have really big implications for the future of Jamaica Bay. 
What are the terms of the agreement? Well, the terms are basically threefold. Um, one is to cut down on the discharge of nitrogen into the bay, which has been a huge source of the pollution for a very long time, some of the highest levels of nitrogen discharge in the world. Um, and so they aim to cut down um, $100 million towards cutting that down by 50% over the next 10 years, um, $15 million towards wetland, more west, wetland restoration, uh, and also increased water quality monitoring. Why is nitrogen an issue? Well, nitrogen in itself is not that bad of a thing. It's good in moderation, but when the levels get really high, it um, decreases water quality, cuts down on oxygen levels, um, causes algae blooms, all kinds of mayhem, basically, in the, in the ecology. Um, and uh, also the um, peninsula, that sort of uh, Rockaway Peninsula, um, blocks off circulate water circulation in Jamaica Bay, and it sort of exacerbates the problem. So what's the timetable for the Paddigate Basin project? Uh, the contract for construction was announced in January. It's going to be starting this spring, and it should be completed in 2012. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Mary Grace. We'll be right back. What's more New York than Broadway? 219 West Jessica Cordemanche talks with an insider who has found the key to unlocking the doors to success. Terry Schreiber is renowned in the New York theater community. I started acting uh, really when I was about 19 years old in college, and then I came to New York in 1960, and uh, I did um, a lot of summer stock. Uh, I did television work. I was in a Broadway play. By 1970, he was even staging his own productions. That was the last time I acted. I acted in one of them, but uh, that was the last time. You haven't acted since? Not since 1970. <laughs> Do you think you'll ever will again? I doubt it. I doubt it. Acting had that Schreiber to directing. I found ultimately directing was much more fulfilling for me than acting. The working on the whole gives me more satisfaction than working on the part. And directing led to producing. He founded the T. Schreiber Acting Studio more than four decades ago as a theater company and a training center for actors. It quickly became one of New York's most respected off-off-Broadway theaters. One night, Dustin Hoffman walked in, and my house manager <laughs> jumped up and came running back and said, Dustin Hoffman's standing in the door. What should I do? And I said, sell him a ticket. Today, the director is still selling tickets. A production of The Cherry Orchard, which he directed, just finished showing at his Midtown studio. My whole goal for the 41 years has been to provide an actor a place to take class and work on the process of the work and have the productions to do the result. I'm here more to serve the actor. When, you have a, when you're doing a scene in his class, they're just the two of you and he has very minimal involvement and you get to float around and find your own space. Julie Garfield, the daughter of Hollywood legend John Garfield, is both an actress and acting teacher at the studio. There's a great attitude in this place. There, it's, it's a very positive, very constructive, very creative attitude here. And that's what makes it a special place. I also think Terry finds this to be very important, which I think is lovely. I think it's, um, he comes from a, a time um, and a school that acting in theater was vital. And I think he really shows his students and tries to, um, Im tries to inspire them to feel that way about it as well. But the director knows it takes more than talent and a good attitude to make it in showbiz. You've got to have the tenacity of a pit bull, okay? <laughs> uh, and that does not mean be obnoxious. But you've got to totally focus on doing this. So it's not just the training. It's doing the business end of the business, which frequently defeats some very talented people. I don't know how some of the young kids do stuff nowadays because it's just so horrendously difficult to pay rent and, and, and everything else. Rick Forsman was a cameraman in his working life and has studied and performed with the studio since 1995. You just feel like you're where, where the energy is, and New York just has this, this, it's the great big carrot in the sky that everybody <laughs> is reaching for. You know? This is still the theater capital, uh, and I think people flock here because of that. I think it's the Mecca. It still is the Mecca, you know? Only a few who make that pilgrimage end up succeeding. Edward Norton and Peter Sarsgaard are two A-list actors who started their careers under Schreiber's wing. He's a practical teacher for practical actors, and I still uh, 
daily in my work, I use the things that I learned from him and others, and I still call him all the time and, and have a continuing dialogue with him, which is, the, I think, the true sign of a, of a great relationship with a teacher. I'm really pleased for them, and I'm proud of them. They're, they both earned it. I mean, when I talked about the tenacity of a pit bull, they really work at it. How does it feel for you personally to be that person who help them make it. It's a great feeling because uh, I think the joy of teaching, uh, even if somebody doesn't make it to that level, is to see them break through in the work. On Tuesday, I might have another little talk with them again. <laughs> It is a path that I still can't realize that I'm on and, and, and this is what I've done. I, I want it to go on after me and, you know, I want the legacy of it to go on. You know, I realize, you know, now uh, this is what I've done with my life and I'm pleased with it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm contented with it. For 219 West, I'm Jessica Cordemosh. I think I arranged this little rendezvous. I can't have that. Mm. Terry Schreiber isn't the only one helping people who want to make it in the entertainment industry. The city has created a job training program for those who are underrepresented in the production side of film and TV. New York City is a magnet for movies and TV shows, but production crews often lack diversity. To address this issue, the Mayor's Office of Film, Theater and Broadcasting has created the Made in New York Production Crafts Training Program to prepare women and other disadvantaged groups for these jobs. Brooklyn Workforce Innovations the job training center chosen to run the program, recently held a recruitment event for the four-week pilot class. Applicants were required to have one to three years of experience and be committed to working in the grip department, which is responsible for setting up the cameras and lights on set. Jamie Nudd works as a freelance grip on independent projects. She applied to the program in the hopes of expanding her horizons. I want to definitely get on bigger shoots with bigger budgets. You know, I've worked on very low stuff. You know, the most I've worked on is like a feature for a couple of days that had a pretty decent budget. But I feel like the connections here, you can get on some bigger shoots with bigger equipment, bigger lights, which I like. Fan of that. So yeah, I definitely hope to work with some equipment that I've never really gotten the chance to work with on like low budget stuff, you know. <laughs> I've kind of done that for the last year on the low budget, so it'd be nice to start working with some bigger tools and toys. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, so they kept saying, um, you know, you have to lock in, like, you're going to be in the grip department for 10 yeah. to 15 years, and, and you're okay with that? Yeah, I'm definitely, I've been, ever since I, I went to film school for a couple years, and I was like, I don't really care about directing and writing and all that stuff that everyone else went to film school for, but I fell in love with lighting and stands and sandbags and lifting heavy things for some reason, so here I am. Um, yeah, definitely I'm in it for the long haul. Nikki Penalba has been a grip for 13 years. But when she first started, her male colleagues never dreamed she would stick with it. I don't think I was being taken seriously about me wanting to work in the business. I, rem I recall a lot of the guys saying things like, um, <clears throat> yeah, just keep on doing this, let's see how long you last. Laura Sapphire had a similar experience when she tried to find work in the electric department, which is closely related to the grip department. It was really difficult to get work initially as an electrician, as a female electric, because I would have a hard time getting hired in the first place because they would take one look at me and say that there's no way you can deal with the gear that we need to. You can't, you can't possibly be strong enough. You're too short. It was like a physical issue. And, and I understood that to some extent, but um, there are lots of really short, small men that I work with, so I don't see why I'm any worse than them. Um, so initially, it was hard to get electrician work, uh, and then my, my male friends that we started together, they sort of shot ahead on the bigger projects faster, because the older guys will take them on as like, oh, you remind me of me when I was a kid, and I'll teach you how to work the generator, and blah, 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 and then they would send me out to get coffee for the rest of the crew. Without even thinking, I know it wasn't really meant to be malicious, but most of the time they just felt like uh, they wouldn't take me seriously and they figured, oh, maybe she thinks she wants to do this for a week or two. I'm not really going to put effort into training her or teaching her the skills. You know, we'll just have her hang out and, and you know, be entertained for a little bit and then we'll get rid of her. What advice would you give to women who are trying to break into the traditionally male roles in filmmaking, like the grip or electric? 
you have to just find some people that you really enjoy working with and to try and get trained is how I think everyone should start, men and women. It's just a little bit harder, I think, sometimes for women to find a crew um, that will take you in and teach you the craft. But that's, that's the, sort of the hardest first step is just finding people that uh, are not patronizing, that will teach you, uh, that will teach you the trade. Taking the first step has paid off for Jamie Nudd, who was accepted into the pilot class of the Made in New York Production Crafts Training Program. Out of about 15 people, she is one of four women. For 219 West, I'm Mary Grace Murphy. In tough economic times like these, one of the longest of long shots is trying to start a new small business. We've heard about companies too big to fail, but what about companies that may be too small to make it? David Montalvo has found two businesses that have defied the odds. With dairy-free cheese and free-range chicken, this is not your typical New York pizza joint. But that's the point. Like, you know, there are a couple of places in the city that are okay, but they're not great. So I think here's a niche opportunity, you know. Agrawal is from Canada, and she recently took a chance on her dream of opening a pizza joint in the West Village. It offers natural and organic food options. Is this uh, a real pizza joint? <laughs> no, not really. It's very alternative and very interesting, but it, it still maintains the integrity of what pizza is, and sort of that, that, that feeling that you get when you have a pizza party. It, that, you know, those feelings are still there. A pizza party for the health conscious. Yeah, cheese for vegans. We also have our cheese is 100% organic. We get direct from Organic Valley. Agrawal's own health problems with dairy products inspired her to open up Slice even as small businesses around her were closing down. In fact, this is her second pizzeria. She opened her first one five years ago on the Upper East Side, defying the odds. Most small businesses don't survive five years, according to the U.S. Small Business Administration. And as the recession worsened, so did the number of small business bankruptcies and closures. But, Agrawal said, the recession actually helped her. I think it was the timing was right, and also this recession, rents are down, people are, I mean, this whole, this is like a ghost town, the Hudson Street, every restaurant's closing, and so the, the landlords were, you know, were in need of people, and so we were able to negotiate a decent rent price, you know, for this neighborhood. A neighborhood that continues to attract entrepreneurs from virtually all over the world, despite the hard economic times. I mean, Manhattan is a different animal from the rest of the country. You know what I mean? It, it, I think every neighborhood has, uh, you know, an, it, this, this, this city is, is an educated city. I mean, you know, whether we like it or not, we have an, an upper echelon, the, the best of the best come to New York City for a reason. And, um, to and make I, it? To make it and to, you know, to be around motivating people. And I think it's an energizing city to be in. An energy that also attracted Mexican-born Sandra Ovando, the owner of a flower shop located just two blocks away. Ovando has effectively made it, but won't have you believe that. And you've never really made it. I mean, of course you made it, but uh, you're always, like I said, growing. And uh, it makes me happy. It gives me certainly satisfaction, and it makes it uh, worth it. Ovando opened up her flower shop on Bleecker Street seven years ago. Our, our design uh, philosophy, um, in a nutshell, is simple, not simplistic. So we make the arrangements and the flowers appear very simple in, in their natural state and beauty. And, uh, but it's not easy to make the arrangements that, that we make. I mean, believe me, uh, you can see the designers, they, they, they take a quiet uh, amount of time to, to create them. And uh, we work very much with uh, bold colors. I mean, I'm Mexican and we, there is a lot of color in Mexico. So uh, bold colors, um, strong um, flowers that have their own uh, personality. Indeed, it's easier for Ovando to characterize a flower's personality than to characterize her own. What flower do you think represents you? Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. What flower do I think represents me? I don't know if, uh, if I can answer that. Uh, Perhaps when you've made it as a small business florist in New York, you don't need to know what your flower is. Tabloids have labeled Ovando a celebrity floral designer. Maybe because we have some clients that are celebrity. 
Uh, probably. Yeah? Yes. Are you allowed to tell us which? No. No? <laughs> no, otherwise they wouldn't work with us. <laughs> then they won't work with you. Um, no, they trust us and, uh, and uh, we take it very seriously. And it's a trust she has built through the 10 to 14 hour days she puts into her business. I'm always pushing the envelope. I'm never satisfied. I mean, I'm happy for a, for a second, <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, what's next? So I'm very lucky because I have it inside me. That's just my personality. I'm constantly searching uh, for uh, for newer newer things. Where do you look? Where do you search? Why you look? What am I looking for? I want to know. I don't know. <laughs> but what she does know is how to make it in New York, and that raises another question. What is Ovando's next dream? I want to go to the Upper East Side. That's really where I want to go. And she offers this tip to small business hopefuls. Be passionate and work hard. That's what I would recommend. David Montalvo, 219 West. Ines Bebea is a business reporter at CUNY J School, and she has been following small business trends. She has some advice from experts for anyone who wants to start a small business. So Ines, what are the tips for people who might want to start a small business? Well, the main thing is you need to have a business plan to know as far as like how much money you need to have saved to survive the first two years, have an accountant, have a different bank account for the business, as well as insurance, have an attorney who will help you navigate the legal issues of creating an LLC or an Inc. or things of that sort. And so um, what about people who might want to open up the business out of their own homes to cut down on cost? Well, there's definitely a danger of merging your personal and your private. You definitely want to have a separate location, like I said, because of the insurance issues. You want to be able to have that liability only on the business and not so much on your home and your family life. So this is really uh, helpful information. And if somebody wanted to find more, do you guys have a website? Right. Um, we have a website called DirtyHandsNY.com, which is basically an avenue for entrepreneurs in New York to let us know where they're doing, where businesses they're starting. And within that, we have a section called Ask the Expert, where we give them advice about the legal issues, financials, attorneys, insurance, and anything that you need to know before you get started. Sounds great. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yes, ready, ready. Oh, come on, Randy. Animal shelter, here I come. And no, I'm not crazy or emotionally damaged. That's a stereotype. I just belong to a total loser. I'm a good dog. So if you want a pet, adopt. And if you see Randy, tell him he dropped his wallet. Next, Rashana Rapkins visits the studio of a Williamsburg artist who, after years of relative obscurity, has shot to fame. Her inspiration? Homer Simpson, Felix the Cat, and Mickey Mouse. At a former dance hall in Williamsburg, Joyce Pensado has been painting for more than 30 years. I found this place with a friend. And so uh, from the outside, it looks totally different than when you come in. It was such a magical place. The Brooklyn-born artist has been drawing and painting since the 1970s, but she didn't get her first individual show until 1994. Early 90s was a major turning point. Uh, it's when I accepted myself for what I was doing. Before, uh, I think before I was very divided. I did abstract paintings and cartoony drawings. And I was supposed to have a show with these abstract paintings, and it was canceled. And it was so shocking to me that made me start looking at what I was about what I was doing and what was important to me. And I, I then felt free enough to say, accept that I love doing these cartoon imagery and why not embrace it and make it one. Just getting it, how I feel, getting the right markings, the right splashes to do what I want, wanted to say, to convey. I, I do because I, I love the forms and and I take it as an abstraction, actually. Okay. Art critic Gregory Volk first encountered Pensado in Williamsburg, just as he was getting his own start as a writer. 
I saw something really spectacular, idiosyncratic, wonderful, gritty, lovely, uh, and in her uh, in her work. And I also understood that she was really um, beloved, but especially by other artists of a very on a very high level. She was somewhat underknown, uh, well, actually considerably underknown given her talents in the art world, but but a kind of thriving artist artist in Williamsburg. In 1994, Pensado won a Guggenheim Award. Since then, her work has been exhibited internationally. But recognition was a long time coming, even from her own family. Oh my God, have they changed. I used to be a loser, and now I'm a somebody. <laughs> uh, my mom saw a little bit of it, and uh, but my brother, in his own way, has been very supportive towards me. A major change was before it was like nobody, who's going to support this? Who's going to, it's getting you nowhere. Why you keep still doing the same thing? Get a job. <laughs> uh, and then all of a sudden being accepted, and now he wants to manage my career. <laughs> when is the check coming in? That's what I hear. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, what are some of the benefits of, of receiving um, a little more attention on your work? I wish this for all artists, uh, whatever. I mean, it's finally getting recognition by your peers and getting money to, that you don't have to struggle so much. And uh, I, I feel uh, I'm at a place where this is the place I always dreamed of is to uh, do what you love and uh, make a couple of dollars out of it. In 2009, Pensado joined forces with two graffiti artists to paint a mural for the Cooper Square Hotel. So, so when I saw that wall, the shape of him, I thought, oh my God, it's Homer. I don't know what it is. What is it? I mean, are they trying to fix it or are they trying to cover up uh, some uh, Graffiti? I, I'm not sure. It's very nice. I feel like the, the face was a little bit like uh, under the rain. I just like it because black and white are some of my favorite colors. Nice depiction of the life that is black and white. Only in the last like couple years has she sort of deservedly um, hit the big time. Although some neighbors were puzzled by the mural, Volk feels that Pensado is a 21st century artist who will get her due. Her work absolutely fits with uh, with its time and 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 its milieu uh, with, with this uh, with a uh, uh, with a country that is hopeful yet in crisis, uh, troubled yet optimistic, uh, gritty yet uh, yearning for a better future. Uh, and her paintings seem to move in in this uh, in this kind of shifting, uh, conflicted time uh, extremely well. And so I'm not, I'm not surprised at all that this great idiosyncratic, some ways visionary painter belatedly is understood to be like one of the truly significant um, artists of her time. As she ponders her next steps, Pensado will continue to explore and transform some of the most iconic images of American culture. Roshana Rapkins for 219 West. That's this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you for watching us. I'm Margaret Teich. And I'm Mary Grace Murphy. Next month, we'll have more stories about the people and issues of New York City. You can also find us on iTunes. From all of us at 219 West, take care.